Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would bless the production here this morning. Um, we know that yesterday we had problems from the, the storms. We ask that you'd bless the transmissions that go out from here today. We ask that you pour your latter rain out upon us and help us to understand the light that you're opening before us at this time. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three handouts today. Um, the first is an announcement or an advertisement for some Zoom teaching that Theodore Turner is doing in Canada. It'll be, for those of you watching on the web or wherever, um, it's on there. You can, you can look it over and it'll tell you how to connect with that, those studies. And then yesterday, um, I made at least two mistakes. Yesterday, um, things were hard around here because of the, the windstorms that we had here in this area. We didn't get the tornadoes like some of the other states around us did, but we got windstorms, so we had um, some problems with technical issues. So I've heard randomly from some of you that you couldn't watch everything yesterday, that there was disruptions. Um, so it's, it's online now. You can, you can do that catch up, um, but I made a couple mistakes. Theodore Turner, when he can, he, he follows my presentations um, and then he corrects me when he sees some of the um, things that I'll, I'll express incorrectly. The chronological stuff is not my forte. I get most, not all, but most of the insights on the chronology either from Theodore, Odilio, or Stephen. And one of the things I did yesterday is I took a chiasm from the, t the second Italian camp meeting and I put it in the second Italian camp meeting, but I also put it in the first Italian camp meeting and it doesn't, it, there, that didn't exist in the first Italian camp meeting. But um, Theodore caught it and he sent in an email. This is his email here. That's also on the notes um, with, a, with a few charts to explain it. So it's self-explanatory. And on the bottom, one other thing that he noted is that uh, it says also October 13th is not the 15th day of the 8th month. Um, in previous charts, that was listed that way. And what I've been doing as I've been preparing these things, I've taken several sets of notes over the past several months. I brought them all together and then I'm cutting and pasting and trying to organize everything in a in a, in a fashion that makes sense to me so I can regurgitate it. And evidently I grabbed a, an older chart that had October 13th as the 15th day of the eighth month. That's incorrect. So you have that. That's, both of those corrections are available to you. And I'm not gonna spend time dealing with them um, because I'm at a, a, a crossroad here trying to get beyond a couple things so I can get back into explaining these things in the context of Daniel 11, verse 40 and 41. So I pointed you to the notes that you have in front of you for today that on the top of the page is 2014. I pointed, it, pointed them to you yesterday. This is the, the last part of yesterday's notes that I just cut and pasted to start this uh, presentation. And I'm not going to go through all these Bible quotes because I want to I want to get to further on down the road. Most of this is old established truth. Um, but I am going to spend some time identifying the some of the components of the Omega apostasy and you may you may listen to that and think wh why is he laboring the activities of P and T? Haven't we heard that enough? And the reason that I'm doing it isn't um, isn't for the reason that you might think. I've come to realize that the pillar was moved, and what I mean by that is the Lord has now, through His providential leading, told us that we are to come out of our tents, our message is no longer for Adventism, but it's for the world, and my argument is, is that one of the providential things that He put in place that allows us to see that the pillar has moved was the Omega apostasy. So. I have to go back and revisit that so you can see the logic. It's not so much about 
what they're doing as it is the role it plays in the prophetic sequence of events. So on the top of page one, you have some references to the pillar, a pillar being a way mark um, when Jacob uh, has his dream of the ladder. He sets up a rock as a pillar. It's a way mark. A lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt. It's a, a way mark. Um, so when Sister White says in the next quote that Daniel 8.14 is the central pillar of Adventism, um, that was a way mark. Of course, we know that October 22nd, 1844 is a way mark. It's a pillar. And then under the next heading, God's leading, um, Go to Numbers, well, that's one we read on Sabbath. That was the scripture reading that when the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud moved, then the children of Israel were to gather up their things and move with it. So we're supposed to follow that pillar, and that pillar represents, among other things, the leading of God. Okay, he's leading his people. Um, and, and Exodus 13, 21 and 22 confirms that. So why do we have to deal with this? thought is because we came to understand that at 9-11, when the angel came down, that that had been typified by August 11th, 1840, and in Revelation 10, on August 11th, 1840, John is told to take the little book out of the angel's hand and eat it. And at 9-11, when we seen that these two histories were parallel, we began to grapple with what it meant to eat it, and we found that to eat the little book is to come into a covenant relationship with the Lord. The covenant relationship, the sealing of the 144,000, the sprinkling of the latter rain began at 9-11. And when we further studied out what the eating of the little book was, um, we found that Jeremiah eats the little book, Ezekiel eats the little book, and John eats the little book. And you can see the passage in Ezekiel where he eats the little book, chapter 2, verse 1, all the way through chapter 3, verse 9. And I have in your notes um, verse 5 of chapter 3, which was a, became a point of contention. It's one of the reasons that Path of the Just separated, uh, and it became a, a, an issue we dealt with in our history. Verse 5 of Ezekiel 3 says, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. When you eat the little book, as Ezekiel did, you have a message to carry to Adventism, not outside of Adventism. And this became something that we battled for. I've already received an email rebuke from one of the people that jumped ship a long time ago saying, oh, you guys are now with this Nashville thing, you, you've come out of your tents and the God hasn't given you permission to come out of your, your tent. That's not word for word, but they understood that we, in that history, this was an established truth that the message is for Adventism, but what I'm saying is, through God's providence now, He has told us the message is to go outside of Adventism. The pillar has moved. Um, now, I have Jeremiah 15, 16 through 21, and we've used this often through the years as an illustration of Millerite history and our history. Um, with this kind of just study that I'm doing right now, it may be hard to remind yourself that I'm dealing with the four kingdoms in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, those being three satanic kingdoms and the kingdom of the 144,000 being the fourth. Dealing with the kingdom of the dragon as illustrated in the story of the king of the south in Daniel 11. I'm dealing with the kingdom of the false prophet as illustrated by Donald Trump and the Constitution of the United States. And I'm dealing with the kingdom of the beast as, as set forth in the story of Fatima. And then in the story of the 144,000, we have at least three primary storylines of the prophet, priest, and king. But these are the wheels within the wheels of Ezekiel. They have connections. We've been seeing that. We've been seeing that um, because we can show that the end of the King of the South, the end of Russia, begins on November 9th and ends on December 25th, uh, 2019, uh, 2021, respectively. Um, we see that once the king of the south wins that victory that has been typified by, Vac by Raphia, from there, that point on, he's just spiraling downhill, as Ptolemy did in, Daniel, in the history of Daniel. He wins his victory, and then he goes into a drunken party time, 
and the next thing we see is the king of the north takes him out. So we've taken that as a as a point of reference I have to show that all these other kingdoms that go through this same dynamic of Raphia and Paneum that that characteristic transfers with it. For instance, the king of the south and the story of the United States, the story of Trump, the story of the Constitution, they prevailed when they brought articles of impeachment against Donald Trump. That was their raffia, so to speak. That was their victory. But they couldn't follow up on it, and therefore, based upon what has told us about Russia coming to its end, the King of the South, the Democratic Party, is going to do nothing but go off into oblivion now. Um, and we've seen that begin at that point, and it's just, it's continuing on. I can bring news report after news report, both of the Democratic Party and of the news media that supports them, how they're becoming less and less effective. I mean, they're carrying out their presidential campaign like this, okay? They're not out meeting people face to face. They're, it's, in any case, the dynamics of one line, of these four lines in Daniel 11, will occur in the other lines. That's all I'm saying. And there's crossover. That's the wheels within the wheels that we're to see. So if you go now to Jeremiah 15, 16 through 21, which is in your notes, there's one crossover. There's one connection that I want to put in place. It says, Thy words were found. That would be 9-11. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of mine heart. For I'm called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. What does it mean when your name gets changed? Okay, um, That's a covenant relationship. I, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejo rejoiced. There's a distinction there between, at 9-11, between this movement and the Adventist church, okay? This, this distinction between this movement and the Adventist church occurs at 9-11, and it occurs again in this movement, in the Omega movement. So there's some things in here that are wills within wills. I said alone because of thy hand, okay? The, the hand being removed in our history is Raphia and Paneum, and it's going to create a distinction between two classes. For thou hast filled me with indication, why is my pain perpetual and my wounds incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? Okay, there's a misunderstanding about a prophecy. Uh, we understand this based upon the first disappointment in Millerite history. Will thou be altogether unto me as a liar? And Habakkuk says, though the vision Terry, wait for it, it shall not lie. We bring these together. The first disappointment um, is expressed as God's people thinking that somehow God lied to them, but he didn't. They just have to tarry on. They have to wait for it. I thought that the hand being removed was talking about um, Russia. Yeah, it's... it's the hand being removed was the discovery of Raphia and Paneum in our history, but it was typified by the Lord removing his hand from the fullness of your mistake in the Millerite history. And that took place at the first disappointment on April 19th, 1844. And it, it typifies uh, our history. So there, I'm dealing with two histories at the same time as we go down through here. After this disappointment, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vial, thou shalt be as my mouth. Okay? Where do we place the mouth? Speaking. At the speaking. Where do we place the speaking? Sunday. At the Sunday law. Where is the Sunday law for us at, that we're dealing with now? <coughs> July 18th, the first Sunday law, okay? So there's, a, there's some kind of disappointment in this movement, in this history, that if we're faithful and we separate the, the precious from the vile, that we'll be allowed to be his ensign at that first Sunday law. Um, Let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. No returning to the Adventist church, and no returning to the Omega movement. Okay, they can return to us should they choose to do so, uh, but we are now a peculiar people, a chosen people, okay, that is to show forth the praises of him that has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Um, and we're supposed to uphold that distinction. And I will make thee 
unto this people a fenced brazen wall. Now, I'm arguing that he made us a fenced brazen wall on November 9th, 2019. And the reason I'm putting that in place is because November 9th, 2019, although this I'm putting it in place for us, I'm saying that the internal, this movement becomes a brazen wall on November 9th, 2019, but November 9th, 2019 is 30 years after the wall came down at midnight on November 9th, 1989. So that, that way mark that begins this movement in 89 has a wall coming down and when the 30 years of developing a priesthood is finished, there's not a wall coming down, there's a wall being established. But I'm also saying that this marks the beginning of the end of Russia. This is where the, the falling apart of Russia um, starts at that point in time. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. And you have Daniel, 10, Daniel 12, 10 through 12 there. And uh, it, that's simply the everlasting gospel where Daniel doesn't express it as wise and foolish virgins, he express it, expresses it as wise and wicked, okay? So if you're faithful, according to Jeremiah, um, you're taken out of the hand of the wicked. And being in the hand of the wicked means being in connection with them, okay? There's a separation between the wise and the foolish, but in Daniel 12.10 it's expressed as the wise and wicked, but this also has a, a double application because who is the wicked and the terrible in the scriptures? It's, it's the papacy, okay? So if you're faithful in this scenario, uh, you are one that does not grasp hands with the papacy as the rest of the world does, the wicked. Um, and so there's more than just a single line of thought here. And, okay, Numbers 14, 11 through 39 talks about the, the day of provocation, the tenth and final test where the Lord passes by the covenant people he brought out of Egypt and enters into covenant with Joshua and Caleb. And that's leading us into... The, the subject that we came to understand in connection with only taking a message to Adventism, and that is that in the entering into covenant with ancient Israel when he brought them out of Egypt at the beginning of the Hebrew nation and at the end of the Hebrew nation when the Lord was passing by the Hebrews and entering into covenant with Christianity, and at the beginning of modern Israel, when he was passing by the Protestants and entering into covenant with Millerite Adventism, we have three testimonies um, that when you enter into covenant with God, he's going to test you. That's one thing that's in there. Another one is, is that when he's entering into covenant with a people, he's passing by the former covenant people. And this is the story of him entering into covenant with the 144,000. And therefore, when he's doing that, he's passing by the former covenant people, which would be the Seventh-day Adventist Church that has been typified by the Protestants that were passed by in Millerite history, that was typified by the Hebrews that were passed by in the time of Christ, that was typified by the people that came out of Egypt with Moses when they filled that tenth test in Numbers 14. Um, when the spies were sent in to spy out the land. Okay, so that brings us to page three of the notes. All of that, all, everything I've said there is a matter of redundant um, public record, if the redundant's the right word. We've, we've addressed this over and over again in several presentations, so I, I don't intend to spend a, a great deal of time on it. Now you have here on the top of page three the chart of um, Stephen, which shows that when Christ moved into the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844, that it was 1844 days later um, that there was something that happened in that history that's uh, that's markable that you can 
that you can demonstrate through prophecy. He did it um, through a mathematical calculation based upon the Hebrew year being 360 days and be based upon the feast of the Hebrew year that on the Day of Atonement, on the 10th day of the 7th month, it was a work that the high priest did for one day. So he subtracted one day from 360 and left him 359 days. He identified when Christ began his work as the high priest when he ascended to heaven and that was, you can see it in that chart, 27 April 31 AD. He worked in that capacity um, in the terms of the sanctuary, it'd be he worked in the holy place for 359 days because it was a yearly cycle. But the 359 days he calculated out to end on October 21st, 1844, because he, as an Adventist, knows that on October 22nd, Christ began the Day of Atonement. So he took the days, he counted the days from 27 April 31 AD to October 21st, 1844 counted those days, divided them by 359, and found that each day would represent roughly 1,844 days and 21 hours and 15 minutes and 33 seconds, if you want to get accurate. But the thing about the 33 seconds that you need to, that you need to remember is it wasn't 33 seconds right on the nose, was it? The actual day a day in that history of those years equated to 1844 days and 21 hours midnight, 15 minutes and 33 seconds, point three 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 three. Okay, the 33, it, that, that, uh, all I want you to see is that 33, the decimal just goes off into affinity, where you, you can't nail it down, all right, to a, an absolute. And that, that, that impacts us. It impacts us because we're going to deal with 1533, all right, and we're going to, based upon 1533, um, in his chart there, you have Mark 1533, and it opens up our understanding of the sixth hour and the ninth hour. And we realize that on military time, that's what I call it, what is 1533? It's 333. So as we begin to look at these things, in the scriptures we find that 153 is also a symbol. 153. But when it comes to 1533, that, that 3 goes on and on, okay? So what's 153? At a simple level, 153 is the same thing as 1533. 1533, we've established on many witnesses, it's a, a symbol of the manifestation of the power of God. And when the disciples were fishing, uh, they, they tried to catch fish all night long and they couldn't do it. And they, as they're pulling into the shore, Jesus says, cast your net on the other side. And so the, it's, it's morning time, and they've been fishing all night, and he tells them to cast their net on the other side of the boat, and they did, and how many fish did they pull up out of their net? 153. Okay. And then what's he do with Peter? He asks him three times, Lovest thou me? 1533. But the, fifth, the 153 is also a symbol of the, a manifestation of the power of God, if you can understand that for him, for them to cast that net in and instantaneously have 153 fish. Um, and by the way, there's some numbers that the mathematicians look at, and in these notes you're going to see a Wikipedia reference, a website reference to 153. 153. I can't even understand the mathematical implications of 153. Go to that website and look at it. It is one of these numbers that absolutely has to have been invented by Palmoni. In any case, what we understood was that in the Millerite history, from October 22nd, 1844, until November 9th, 1849, was this one day that Christ would have been in the most holy place doing that work. And the conclusion we formed, we had a misconception about it, was that this is the close of probation for everyone that's a priest. But when we go, went in a previous presentation and looked at that history, 
Um, we found that in 1850, after they had went through that experience, the 1850 chart was introduced. And the change of dispensation that was being emphasized wasn't the close of probation for the, the wise priest. It was the change of dispensation that now those people that had moved by faith into the most holy place were to take a message to the world. The 1850 chart is a symbol of that. Uh, the 1850 chart you can show is an ensign, okay? Um, that it, it, the both of them together are an ensign. And uh, do the, does the Ten Commandments get lifted up before the world at the end? Okay, the Ten Commandments are an ensign. The Ten Commandments typify the two charts. Um, and the, what, what, how did they commemorate the giving of the law in ancient Israel? Pentecost. And what did they do at Pentecost? They lifted up the two wave loaves. Okay, the Ten Commandments, the two wave loads, the two tables, they are ensigns. And in 1850, the second of those two tables is put together because it's destined to be an ensign for those outside of Adventism. And we, in the, you have notes to show that when the Lord is entering into covenant with the people, He always first does an exclusively internal work before He goes to the world. Uh, 40 years with ancient Israel, and then he goes to conquer Jericho. Um, one week at the end of ancient Israel, that was an exclusive work for the Jews before they went to the Gentiles in AD 34. And Advent history tells us that from 1844 to 1850, it was an internal work. Three witnesses saying that we have an internal work. And what we've come to understand now, correcting our previous misunderstanding, and I'm emphasizing that point because that was a characteristic of Millerite history, is they had a previous understanding of what it meant for the Lord to cleanse the sanctuary that prevented them from seeing October 22nd, 1844 correctly. So as this history gets repeated in our history, because Millerite history is repeated to the very letter, we have had a misunderstanding about what 1844 represented. The Lord opened up that the Day of Atonement went from, at the prophetic level, from October 22nd, 1844 to November 9th, 1849. And then he opened up, as Stephen's study shows, that from October 22nd, 1844 until November 9th, 2019, that there was an internal work going on for the priests of this movement. And once you get to November 9th, 2019, now the pillar is going to move and you're going to take a message outside of Adventism. And the, the easy way to, to, to understand that is you're going to take a message to Nashville. All right. And, and for me, the message of Nashville is more about awakening the Levites than it is actually the, the Gentiles that live in Nashville. But the Levites, when they see this prophecy come to pass, are going to be awakened to the fact that there is a people that had insight on these prophecies. Why would you call that a um, misunderstanding if God didn't open it up until now? It's, it's like we were supposed to be in the tents now it's it's not if you say it's a misunderstanding it makes you one think that maybe that should have gone back further until you explain it with the date on it so i'm not say, i'm saying our, i'm saying he's opened up now that that millerite history is giving us the testimony to support the work of carrying a message outside of adventism but our misunderstanding was that when we got to November 9th, okay, and now we're supposed to, what, what he wanted us to see is now we have a message outside of Adventism, and what we saw is, well, isn't probation closed for all the priests? So it's not to sound like we've been in the tent way too long, it's just since November of last year that we didn't catch on. Right. And what, what, we, were, what we were overwhelmed with on November 9th is we had told ourselves, this is the close of our human probation as priests. Okay, we're, we're done. And that wasn't the lesson that comes from that history. The lesson was that now it's time to go outside of your tents.
You said there was 153 fish. Okay, well, we'll get there. I'm just planting because some seeds. Because they were so much that it almost broke the no, net. No, it was, it's, it, it's 153, trust me. Okay. Go to, go to John 21, is it John 20? John 20, 21 11, or 20 11, one or the other. John 21 11. And I don't want to go there yet. I, uh, I was, no, I'm, no, I'm saying the reason, I'm telling you why I said that. I'm introducing probably a new concept for everyone, and I just want to let you hear it one time, long before we get there, so it starts getting settled in. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and 153, for all there were so many, yet was the, not the net broken. Wow. Why does it quote 153? Wow. Why? So well, it's so read. strange. Okay, you've read it, but it never clicked. No. Okay, I'm saying that 153 is also 1533. Okay, but I, we're not there yet. That's All right, fine. not a problem. Okay, so this, where we're at, is absolutely important to see. We're still on page three. Because over here, what I'm, what I'm trying to show over here is, this is the, the four generations, okay, of Adventism, if we want to approach it this way. The first generation from 1798 to 1888, second generation to 1990, third generation to 1957, fourth generation to 1989. We've been going over this a little bit here recently. We've did it in the past over and over again. But we need, it needs to click on for us that at 9-11, we got to return to the old past. And by returning to the old past, we get tested by these same four tests that Adventism was tested upon. And the first one in 2009 is when the, the jealousy begins uh, with Parminder. This is when he's here. Um, he does, it, he does it, the presentation on the 2520. And in 2012, he forms an alliance with Tess and her mother, um, a secret alliance, and this is the secret chambers. And then in 2018, uh, they begin the introduction of their false Lateran message, okay, because th these are the characteristics of these four generations, and it's in the third and fourth generation where the Lord is going to judge them, but the judgment is going to come at the Sunday Law, July 18th. So we need to see this in terms of prophecy. Parminder begins in 2009. It's a 10-year period, a testing time. Not that he's being tested, we're being tested. You go, you go look at the Alpha Apostasy, and there, I've been teaching this for years, and there was always something that clicked, about, clicked on me that I, I never could fully resolve, but I couldn't turn away from it. Um, there, it, it, the, the word isn't popping into my mind, but when you take the passages of Sister White where she's talking about the Alpha Apostasy, one place she says, uh, the Alpha Apostasy, the Omega will be of a startling nature. That word startle. And if you go to the Webster's Dictionary and look up startle, it's alarm. Okay? And if you go look up the word alarm, it's startle. So they're interchangeable words. So when she talks about the Omega Apostasy, she says it'll be of a most startling nature. And then one time when she was commenting on the Alpha Apostasy, she says the most alarming thing was that the leaders that should have seen this apostasy didn't see it. Okay? So the alarming thing, the startling thing, is that the apostasy was supposed to have been recognized right from the start, but it wasn't. Okay? So when I'm marking this 10-year testing period that begins here in Arkansas, when Parminder was here, until 2019, this isn't a test for him. This is a test for those of us that were supposed to recognize this rebellion for what it was, and we didn't really do it till we get down here right at the end of the testing time. Okay, but that's noted in the Alpha and Omega commentary by Sister White. 
so where, where we need to look at um, is Parminder's prediction of 2014. This was a satanic prediction designed to prevent us from seeing the truth. And um, we gave the line of our history. And the second um, camp meeting, once the history of Ezra 7-9 started, the first one was eating the hidden manna, and then 120 days later took us to the second camp meeting, which was, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And in that period of time of that second camp meeting, the third day, the third day, was October 22nd. Okay, so the camp meeting, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, um, in 2014, where all this starts, included October 22nd of that year, and it was the third day of that camp meeting. And October 22nd, 1844, was the third day in connection with John 2.20. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. But oh, uh, this temple was 46 years in the building. And from 1798 to October 22nd, 1844, is 46 years, but it's three days. And the third day, the third angel arrived on October 22nd, 1844. So don't miss that at the Behold the Bridegroom Cometh camp meeting, in this history that we were laying out yesterday, it was the third day um, and that, that this took place. But don't... So what I'm saying is, is when it comes to 2014 here, the date that we put with it is October 22nd. 10... 22. Why do we do that? Okay, you have the logic under in the notes here. Um, Hiram Edson discovers this chiasm of the 2520. You can see it on the bottom graph. Okay, but Hiram Ensign presented this message in 1856 and Adventism refused to follow on and in 2005 Hiram Edson's studies is opened up to this movement and by two, shortly thereafter, somewhere between 2005-2009, we're seeing this 126. And we understand that the 126 that begins in 1863 ends in 1989. This is the top graph on page 3. And the 126 that begins in 1888 ends in 2014. And the chiastic structure that's created with the 126, which is a symbol of the 2520, perfectly aligns with the chiasm of the 2520 that begins in 742 and goes to 1863. And you can see this perfect alignment below it. So my point is, is the 126, the 2520, that begins in 1888, it ends in 2014. It ends right here. So in 2014, because Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning, you have to see the characteristics, the prophetic characteristics of 1888. They have to be there. But what we understand uh, is with this chiastic structure up here of the 359 days and the one day, not the chiastic structure, this structure of Stephen of one day representing 1844 days, we see this parallel line that if you begin on October 22nd, 2014, it takes you to November 9th, okay, this of 2019. This is... October 22nd, 1844, takes you to November 9th, 1849. 49, in Millerite history. And when you bring that line to our history, line upon line, then November 9th, 2019, the same amount of days, 1844 days, takes you back to October 22nd, 2014. Okay? So, on October 22nd, 2014, not only are we to see the characteristics of 1888, 
but we are to see the characteristics of October 22nd, 1844. What Satan tried to do here in 2012 is say that 2014 is a Sunday law. <laughs> it just, and he, it, it, he never backed down. It, it, never, it didn't back down because this is, this way mark here, this is absolutely of supreme importance. Okay, you have, you have to understand the significance of this. Now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through this, um, these notes. Once again, this is all review on this movement. Um, on bottom of page 3, it says rebellion, 1888. October 2014 was exactly 226 years since the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference session held from October 17th to November 4th, 1888. So when we're saying October 22nd, and it's got to also line up with 1888, October 22nd, 1888, the General Conference session was going on in Minneapolis. So it's not just a random pick of the year, it's the very time of the year. October 22nd fell during those days. The name Minneapolis, meaning water city, is a mashup of the Dakota word mini for water and the ancient Greek word polis. Okay, so D Sister White says in 1888, the Lord is pouring out the latter rain, he's pouring out the water. Water is a symbol of that history. And Minneapolis, the name means that very thing. Are you following me? Yes, but them rejecting it would be similar to Watertown. Uh, but them rejecting it would be similar to Watertown. Good point is the point. 1888 does not become a symbol of the, the manifestation of the, the victory of the Holy Spirit. It becomes a symbol of rebellion. Yeah. Okay, it's the symbol of rebellion. And that's what we have to see is this rebellion. This is what we didn't see. For us, it's the rebellion of the Omega apostasy. Amen. Okay, so on page four of your notes, this is all review. The latter rain is to fall upon the people of God. That's Minneapolis, okay? Lots of water. City of water. A mighty angel is to come down. So the mighty angel that comes down is the angel of Revelation 18. In 1888 was typifying that. Um, you can see in the next quote, I know that a work must be done for the people, or many will not be prepared to receive the light of that angel sent down from heaven to lighten the whole earth with his glory. Do, do not think that you will be found as vessels unto honor in the time of the latter rain to receive the glory of God if you're lifting up your souls to vanity. Speaking perverse things in secret, cherishing roots of bitterness brought from the conference in Minneapolis. Now please notice, she's saying that 1888 is the angel coming down in Revelation 18. She's saying that. She's saying it's the latter rain, but she's associating the rebellion of 1888 with a secret. Okay? It's the second generation where the secret chambers are. And the second generation begins in 1888, and they're doing things in secret. She has line after line about how at the end of the day's meetings in Minneapolis, she was taken into the rooms of these guys that were fighting the message and they were they were bad mouthing her and her son and Jones and Wagner and they were working out these secret activities okay this history is about secrecy this down here this is about an alliance that was secretly formed in Wales between Wales and Australia okay so these characteristics I'm putting in place and I haven't finished this quote I'm going to drop to the next paragraph I want you to see one more thing there is a work to be wrought in the heart of each one that you may not so tears. When the lips of the watchman are touched with the live coal from off the altar of the Lord of hosts, the trumpet will give a certain sound. So I'm wanting you to see that 1888 is also Isaiah 6. Okay, it's also Isaiah 6 because in Isaiah 6 is when Isaiah's lips are touched with the coal. And Isaiah 6 is Ezekiel 1.1. Okay, because the visions of Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John are the same vision. So this, this also is a symbol of what? Midnight. Okay, this, this is midnight. But, I'll, I'll read on. 
The trumpet will give a certain sound very different from the sound we have hitherto to herd. God has a living testimony for the world. This tame, lifeless sermonizing is not of God's order. She's speaking about what's coming out of the rebellion of Minneapolis. And notice the next sentence. I appeal you, to you, men in responsible bis positions, do not seek to meet the world's standard, standard to catch the world's ideas. The people that are going into rebellion the ideas and the standard that they're going to seek for are the world's standards and the world's ideas. Okay, so did, we've seen that, right? Okay. Um, now notice in the next quote, that was 1888 materials 442. The next quote is manuscript releases volume 14, page 109-110. This is important in my mind to see. When I purposed to leave Minneapolis, the angel of the Lord stood by me and said, Not so. Ellen White was so disgusted on the rebellion in 1888 that she decided she's leaving. And the angel tells her, You can't go. You have to record this. You have to be here to witness this. Not so. God has a work for you to do in this place. The people are acting over the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So we have to see here in 2014 the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I have placed you in a proper position which those who are not in the light will not acknowledge, they will not heed your testimony, but I will be with you. My grace and power shall sustain you. It is not you that they are despising, but the messengers and the message I send to the people. Here, in this history, two things are going to manifest in the rebels. They're going to despise the message that God has sent and the messengers that he has sent. Okay? So, um, now notice, dropping down to this sentence in that same paragraph where there's some more boldface. They would not that God would manifest his spirit and his power, for they have a spirit of mockery. Remember Jeremiah 15. I would not stand, stand with the, the mockers. Okay? And the spirit of mockery and disgust at my word. Okay, the mockers, they don't want to trust in a thus saith the Lord. Now, the next, the next paragraph, and when you read this paragraph in the spirit of prophecy, most times, if it's, if it's there ten times, I don't think it's there ten times, but if it's there ten times, eight of the times you have the editors of the book throwing comments in, saying, uh, this isn't really so. Uh, many of these men did, did turn around and repent, okay? But let's just read this. Light has been shining in Battle Creek and clear bright rays, but who of you, who of those that acted a part in the meeting in, at Minneapolis have come to the light and received the rich treasures of truth which the Lord sent them from heaven? Who have kept step and kept step and step with the leader Jesus Christ, who have made full confession of their mistaken zeal, their blindness, their jealousies, and evil surmisings, their defiance of truth, not one. And because of their long neglect to acknowledge the light, it has left them far behind. They have not been growing in grace and in the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. Um, next. We haven't seen not one. Yeah. At least in our town. Anyway, next paragraph. The position taken at Minneapolis was apparently an insurmountable burial barrier which in a great degree shut them in with doubters, questioners, and rejectors of truth and the power of God. When another crisis comes, those who have so long resisted evidence piled upon evidence will again be test tested upon the points where they failed so manifestly and will be, it will be hard for them to receive that which is from God and refuse that which is from the powers of darkness. But they can. It will be hard for them, but they will be able to. Achieve. Yeah, yeah. You, you, the thing you want to plug in here probably is the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem could have been destroyed in AD 34 at the stoning of Stephen, but the the Lord gives them a period of grace until AD 70. Yes. And that's not true. That there has not been one that has left that movement. 
Why? In this town. I'm talking about in this town. There is. Who? Myself. Amen. So there's hope. Let's not go there. We're not worried about that at this point. Because i got to get through a bunch of material. Next quote. It is hardly possible for men to offer greater insult to God than to despise and reject the instrumentalities that he has appointed to lead them. They had not only done this, but had purpose to put both Moses and Aaron to death. What's this commenting on? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now she's, she's lined up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram with the rebellion in 1888, and she's teaching his things if we're willing to see. Secrecy is part of it. A former jealousy. Okay, we're going to show that the jealousy comes over here. Because the image of jealousy is first, and then the secrecy. Okay, but here is Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and what she's emphasizing here, once again, is it's the instrumentalities that the Lord has put in place to lead them that they're in rejection of. Okay. So, it's amazing. This, this blows my mind. Is that, is that why you were dead? Yes. Yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff. I have to move through this. This is this is review. I've taught this before. Okay, Signs of the Times, September 16th, 1880 said, The sad history of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who led ancient Israel into rebellion, is recorded as a warning to the people of God until the close of time. So, I'm putting this in place to say, we do have the right to take that dispensation and bring it down to our history. But on a secondary sense, I'm saying we have the right to take Sister White's counsel where she says Korah, Dathan, and Abiram typify 1888 and take 1888 and bring it along with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram into our history. We bring them together. Um, neither Neither let us tempt, the, tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. We, we usually read that quote, but we don't read the f first part of it. Yeah, now, yes. Now, in terms of the discussion we're having about whether anyone can turn back... In that, where I started in that quote, drop down to the third big final paragraph, and just <coughs> the last couple sentences. Yet our gracious God shows himself a God of justice and mercy. He made a distinction between the instigators, the leaders in rebellion, and those who had been led by them. He pitied the ignorance and folly of those who had been deceived. Okay, so there's a distinction there being marked between the leaders and those people that have been deceived. Um, now, 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 in this next paragraph, different quote, she's going to quote John chapter 6. So, so what happens in John chapter 6? In, in, in chapter 6, 6, 6, chapter 6, verse 66, he loses most of his disciples and they turn and walk no more with him forever. So it's the same idea that it's the purging of the rebels in the time of Christ, the way the rebels of Korah, Dathan, and Byram were purged. And there's really no evidence that any of these in John 6, 6 ever return. We're told they don't walk no more with Christ. So she's not going to deal with that, but I just want you to note that she's going to reference John 6. Many who are seeking a preparation for the Lord's work think it essential to accumulate large volumes of historical and theological writings. They suppose that the study of these works will be of great advantage to them in learning how to reach the people. This is an error. As I see shelves piled with these books, some, some of them rarely looked into, I think, why spend money for that which is not bread? The sixth chapter of John tells us more than can be found in such works. Christ says, I'm the bread of life. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the schools of the prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today we are to consider the dealing 
dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in the history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements. And that's what I was trying to show on the line yesterday. God's providence in these footsteps in this ministry through the years. That the footsteps are marked by these, these numbers that are of His choice, not ours. Okay, And we're to study that <coughs> along with the nations of the world. I'm saying that that's Daniel 11's vision. It's the three enemies and the 144,000. It's those four king kingdoms. And this is a, 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 a classic quote in this movement from Great Controversy 343. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our time. That's usually where we stop, but the next paragraph says, No truth, no truth, is more clearly taught in the Bible than that, that God by His Holy Spirit especially directs His servants on earth in the great movements for the carrying forward of the work of salvation. So I'm saying that when you have the reform movement of the 144,000, there's no truth connected with the study of that movement, which you're supposed to study, that is more dwelt upon than that the Lord chose the men that He was going to choose to do that movement. And I'm making that point because that is the essence of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram's rebellion and of the rebellion against Jones and Wagner. Okay, so this down here in our history would be the essence of that rebellion. Okay, it was a, an attack against the chosen instrumentalities that the Lord had put in place in this final movement. Okay, now this next one is important to see because the first step in rebellion is the image of jealousy, then the secret chambers. 1888 is where the secrecy was going on among the rebellions. Rebel, the rebels. So you have to see jealousy that precedes that. And in this next quote it says, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and 250 princes who had joined them, first became jealous, then envious, and next rebellious. Okay, this is why I have confidence down here saying this is where the jealousy began. It has to come first. Jealousy comes first. And then secret rebellion. Okay, and then a false Lateran message. Okay, so th that's the purpose of this. Next quote, the secret chambers. The judgment visited upon the Israel served for a time to restrain their murmuring and insubordination, but the spirit of rebellion was still in their heart and eventually brought forth the bitterest fruit. The former rebellions had been mere popular tumults arising from the sudden impulse of, excited, of the excited multitude. But now a deep laid conspiracy was formed, the result of a determined purpose to overthrow the authority of the leaders appointed by God Himself. Here, there's a deep laid conspiracy and it goes on in secret. Now, Dropping down into the next paragraph, just if something on the image of jealousy. Yes. You went to the bottom of your quote here. It proves that it's a people's movement because it was no more holy than the people. So it was no longer about the government that God put in place. It was about the people, the where yes socialist. Which one? We could where, um, the image of jealousy at the very last two sentences. Okay. Like, yeah. Uh, that that is absolutely a the argument of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram is. The whole congregation is holy. There's no distinction between us and Moses. That's their argument. So you're saying that the Omega movement is saying... A people's movement. They're this saying, is a people's movement. We're all equality of these people. God hasn't set up one above the other. And I'm saying that's not how God works. And, yeah. yet, and yet, they rule over all those people. That's a but, but, but let me move on. Let me move on. Well, read uh, those last two sentences. 
been they said that Moses and Aaron exalted themselves above the congregation of the Lord and taking upon themselves the priesthood and government and that this office should not be conferred on their house alone. They said that it was sufficient for them if they were on a level with their brethren for they were no more holy than the people who were equally favored with God's peculiar presence and protection. Okay. Yeah. Same yeah. argument as Lucifer in heaven. Yeah. Okay, so I'm already taking the first paragraph of the next quote. I want to get into the second paragraph. Korah, the leading spirit in this movement, was a Levite of the family of Kohath and a cousin of Moses. He was a man of ability and influence. Though appointed to the service of the tabernacle, he had become dissatisfied with his position and aspired to the dignity of the priesthood. The bestowal upon Aaron and his house of the priestly office, which had formerly devolved upon the firstborn son of every family, had given rise to jealousy and dissatisfaction. And for some time, Korah had been secretly opposing the authority of Moses and Aaron. First is jealousy, then the secret conspiracy. Baldness, ice, frost. Anyway. Pardon me? The name is Baldness, ice, frost. That's the name of Korah. Oh. Boldness? Bald. Bald. Baldness? Ice, ice frost. 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 Anyway. <laughs> okay, so next paragraph on page 7. The state of the feeling among the people favored the designs of Korah, of the bald man. In the bitterness of their disappointment, their former doubts and jealousies and hatred returned. They had jealousies, former jealousies. And again, their complaints were directed against their patient leader. The Israelites were continually losing sight of the fact that they were under divine guidance. They forgot that the angel of the covenant was their invisible leader, that veiled by the cloudy pillar the presence of Christ went before them, and that from him Moses received all his direction, directions. Okay. Then comes weeping for Tammuz, which is a false latterine message, and then bowing to the sun. Then since 2014, Sister White say, is good, Sister White's going to say in this quote, since 1888. But I'm arguing that the, the commentary on 1888 and Korah, Dathan, and Abiram can be brought to 2014. So it says, but since the General Conference in 1888, Satan has been working with special power through unconsecrated elements to weaken the confidence of God's people in the voice that has been appealing to them for these many years. Since 2014, Satan has been working with special power through unconsecrated elements to weaken the confidence of God's people in the voice that has been appealing to them these many years. If he can succeed in this, then through the misapplication of Scripture... Then, through the misapplication of Scripture, this is step three. This is the weeping for Tammuz. Through the misapplication of Scripture, he will lead many to cast away their confidence in what? The past work under the messages. The foundations are going. Thus he would set them adrift with no solid foundation for their faith, hoping to bring them fully under his power. Let the attention of our people be called to the special work of the Spirit of God as, he has, as it has been connected with the rise and progress of the three messages, and a blessing will result to the whole body. A revival of faith and interest in the testimonies of the Spirit of God will lead to obtaining of a healthful experience in the things of God. Some who are newly come into the faith claim to have special light from God in regard to these messages, but their new light leads them to set aside the established truth that are the pillars of our faith. They misinterpret and misapply the scriptures. They misplace the messages of Revelation 14 and set aside the work which these messages have accomplished. Thus they reject the great way marks which God himself has established since their new light leads them to tear down the structure which the Lord has built up. We may know that he is not guiding them. The experience of these, those newly come to the faith if the Lord is working upon their minds will be in harmony with the word of God and with his past dealings with his people and the instruction he has given them, he will not contradict himself. So, um, what I'm hoping you see is jealousy comes here, then secret 
conspiracy, rebellion, and then misapplication of scripture. Okay, and and this is this is based upon all of these revelations of history. For the Adventist Church, um, you have the image of jealousy was the setting aside of the charts in 1863. And of course, Ephesus, the council against Ephesus, is you've lost your first love. This was their first love. They set aside those charts. This is Ephesus speaking to 1863. Return to your first love is the call of Ephesus. 1888, the secret chambers, the conspiracy, and the persecution of Smyrna takes place. They send Ellen White to Australia. They break up Jones and Wagner. Persecution of Smyrna is underway. But this here is the first half of four generations. And in the 2520, we see four generations, so to speak, in the 2520 of the Northern Kingdom. You have 1260 years of external des desolation that comes from paganism, followed by 1260 years of internal desolation accomplished by the papacy. And this is repeated in the history of Adventism in the reverse. In these first two generations, the desolation comes all on their own, their own work. It's an internal desolation. And in these two generations, it's external because here's where they reach out to the theologians of apostate Protestantism and Catholicism and they begin to manufacture a new Lateran message. Okay, and this is Pergama. Pergamus. This is the compromise of Pergamus. Weeping for Tammuz was a counterfeit Lateran message. That's why we're saying this. Um, in this history here, in 2018, the Omega movement will begin to manufacture a counterfeit midnight cry, counterfeit Lateran message based upon the introduction of the misapplication of Scripture, such as the Omega dispensational teaching that, got, that came here in 2018, saying what? that the Omega is perfect and all the Alphas that precede it are imperfect. Omega is infallible. That's Catholic doctrine, okay? Catholic infallibility. And so this here in Adventism was an external desolation. Um, and we're coming to the time period where the bowing down to the sun is going to take place. Thyatira is forced church. Uh, and we have, I'm not saying that these last four presidents of the General Conference lived in these histories. I'm just saying that we went through and shown how he fulfilled the image of the beast, that it was his secrecy and financial de dealings that got him into trouble, and that he, uh, someone corrected me, I pointed out that Paulson went to the same university as the previous pope, they didn't correct me. That was, that was correct. Then he gets his PhD from that same university where the previous pope went. Um, and his, his mentor, his mentor was Heppenstahl. And Heppenstahl's famous point of reference was W.W. Prescott that is associated with 1919. So as we dealt with that, the one element I left out that I didn't know is that when Paulson gets his PhD at that university, there's a committee that reviews your, your doctrinal, what you submit for your PhD. Uh, yes, and it was that former pope that was the president of that doctrinal committee. Okay, so there's a connection there, not only with W.W. W. Prescott through Heppenstahl, but with Rome. This, is, this was external desolation for Adventism, and then of course, Ted Wilson here being the son of him really shows us the, the four generations nicely. But all of this is speaking to us. We'd return to the old past at 9-11 and we'll be tested by this four-step desolation of Adventism because that is the, the testing process. It's part of the testing process that we have to be confronted with when we return to the old past. Father in heaven, we are 
handling serious, serious information, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would accompany this message, that um, conviction can be brought upon those that understand it, and that clarity can be brought upon those that are having trouble following the logic. We want to understand these things in a way that edifies us, strengthens us, but also in a way that glorifies you. We ask that you help us to do that. Please bless the the work we're doing here in sending this message out at this time. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.